Again, ladies and gentlemen, a wonderful good morning. Thank you so much that so many have actually come here to one of Berlin's foremost conference venues. And thank you everybody who is online, who is watching us right now. We know that there are already five to a thousand people watching, so the interest in our issue is very high towards social protection for all. Let me kick off with a quote by a Spanish minister for the environment, but I think the quote is a global quote. We're all changing many, many challenges. We're all having many challenges, and we have a triple international crisis marked by pandemic, geopolitics, and energy crisis. And we also have a triple environmental crisis marked by climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. And all of these aspects have direct impact on the lives, livelihood, and welfare of the citizens of every country. And that means there is therefore also the question about the social protection countries need to afford their citizens. We, as a world community and as individual countries, we have to learn fast and adapt even faster to the challenges we encounter. And we have to make sure that our efforts are better connected, that basic rights are observed and protected, that systems can adapt and evolve. And recently, as you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic revealed and exacerbated the social protection gap between countries with high and with low incomes. It also shows that in countries where adaptive social protection systems were in place, response to the shocks and the challenges were much easier. The needed support was provided much faster and in a more targeted manner. In short, resilience was much higher. We can learn from the examples and the systems that did work. Exchange, discuss, implement, and that's why we're here together. Welcome to the Global Forum on Adaptive Social Protection. After all, now we can actually move around again, we can travel, we can come from far places, and whilst you all, ladies and gentlemen, have made it to Berlin, to this beautiful location, right under Gary's whale, at least that's what I always see, we have not forgotten those size aspects. Um, in other words, yes, we do have the global community that is watching with us. After all, it's probably one of the few good things about COVID-19 that we are all online and all much more connected today. Everybody who's here, I don't have to tell you about the value and the importance of adapted social protection. Of course, you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe in it, if you didn't care, if you weren't working in it and for it. And we do actually see that those countries that have an intact and adaptive protection systems and their citizens do profit. So, towards social protection for all in the face of multiple global crises, our pathway, not just for the next three days here in Berlin, but forward and beyond. Let me do a little bit of housekeeping, and I'm going to be doing that quite a number of times during the next couple of days. Um, my name is Connie Schimmer. I'm so happy to be with you, and uh, I'm going to be accompanying you till Thursday afternoon. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, I already see everybody listening to us um, in French and in Spanish. Thank you very much uh, for the work of the interpreters uh, that they are going to do in the next couple of days. And uh, I believe that you all have badges, and I see certainly the first row is equipped with uh, all these badges. Um, please don't lose them. There's some valuable information on them. And uh, also, just a quick heads up for tomorrow, please bring your ID with you, but that's another question. Now, 
We all want you to share what you're listening to, the good sentence that uh, you hear from keynote speakers, that you hear uh, from panelists. So yes, please, go on Twitter, go on LinkedIn, whatever is uh, your choice. Uh, but we have a wish that if you go on Twitter, could you please use the hashtag Global Forum ASP. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just uh, really happy to start the opening properly uh, because uh, I can now introduce uh, the two ladies that are representing the two organizations that have cooperated in order to create this global forum. And uh, let me do the honors and introduce first to you Dr. Bärbel Kofler. She is the Parliamentary State Secretary at the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, and her heart, um, due to also her former jobs, is completely in what we are talking about today, as you will hear later on also during the panel discussion. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, please give her a hand, Dr. Bärbel Kofler. So nice you're here. Well, thank you very much for this warm introduction and for this nice reception. Well, Excellencies, members of parliament who are here, Vice President Murti, uh, ladies and gentlemen, online and offline, I would love to say, here in Berlin and worldwide, listening or also participating in the conference. It's a great honor for me personally, and of course also in the name of Minister Svenja Schulze, to welcome you here all in Berlin to this forum on adaptive social protection. It's very much close to my heart, close to the heart of my minister, close to the heart of the whole ministry, and therefore we are really thankful that you are all here and sharing your insights and your knowledge with us to really go ahead with this important topic. Um, this forum brings us together to discuss the opportunities and challenges of expanding adaptive social protection. And as I was saying, your presence show that this topic is just as important to you as it is to us here in Berlin. Well, actually, we know already a lo lot about social protection. We know a lot about figures already. So if you look into the studies, we see that social protection is one of the most effective instruments for fighting poverty and hunger. And there is clear evidence to that. Well, we have the evidence from the World Bank. Uh, according to the World Bank, the number of people in absolute poverty would be one-third higher without protection, social protection. One-third. Imagine that in a world like we live today, if additionally one-third of people, one-third of our population would be in uh, the need. In low-income countries, social protection improves food security. On average, households that have access to basic social protection spend 13% more on food and consume 8% more calories. And I'm sure that most of the people in the room have seen the effects of malnutrition, especially on children, what that means for their health and for their lifelong perspectives. So if we could increase the number of calories, for example, especially to kids in the next generation, that is already worthwhile undertaking any effort to come up with better offers on social protection. And we see moreover social protection offering great potential for re reducing then also inequalities and fostering equal opportunities. Well, tax funded instruments in particular help to close the gap in between the rich and the poor. There are calculations of the commitment to uh, of the Commitment to Equity Institute that show that such instruments reduce inequality expressed by the Gini Index in middle-income and low-income countries by up to 5%. That is already a start, I would say. This pay of the long term, because children from families with access to basic social protection go to school for longer and are, as I was mentioning before, healthier. So, however, social protection does not just provide security for people who are at the risk of poverty. Well, we discussed a little bit before, uh, our moderator was mentioning the topic of the pandemic. So, if we didn't learn 
in the pandemic and with COVID, what social protection could offer, offer, I don't know which crisis has to be in this world that we learn about the importance. COVID-19 pandemic has shown us really a lot of things. The countries and societies with social protection systems are better able to deal with crisis. For instance, it's an example not from Europe, it's an example from Cambodia. Um, the Cambodian government included an additional 50,000 people in basic social protection with a short time when the pandemic hit. And studies show really that this prevented many of them from being pushed back into poverty. And without that basic social protection, unemployment and poverty in that case in Cambodia would have risen more sharply with negative impacts on economic growth. So the experience, and I underline always the experience, shows that during crisis in particular, it's vital that social protection systems are adaptive because adaptive systems make it possible to provide protection for people even in collective crisis. And collective crisis are the global challenges that we are all facing. It is, has been COVID-19 pandemic. There are probably other pandemics to come up uh, in the future. There are natural disasters caused by climate change, the costs of living uh, crisis we face nowadays in all parts of the world. And often they affect large sections of the population and have severe social and economic impacts. And countries that are able to increase their social benefits quickly in the line with needs and expand them to additional tar target groups are better able to mitigate these impacts. So social protection systems, particularly strengthens, and that's an important point for my government, for my minister also, women and girls who are most often hit, are the most hearted, uh, hard, hearted uh, hits by crisis. Those uh, protection systems give them the access to resources, thus, thus making them more independent. This benefits entire societies. And for instance, if women have equal access to financial resources, they are able to make investments that strengthen then the econom economy again. We also have a lot of studies for that. Scientific studies have proved evidence of these impacts. Yet there are still 4 billion people, half of the world population, who have no access to social protection, half of our world's population. Um, and in certain parts of the world, for example, on the African continent, the share of people without social protection is as high as 83%. So that is the reason why Germany remains committed to the G7 promise to work with international partners to provide access to social protection for an additional 1 billion people by 2025. And another goal is universal access to social protection by 2030. And we shouldn't forget that that's one of the targets under the SDG 1, one of the important targets of the SDG 1. In our development policy, we work toward that goal in our cooperation with partner countries, and we also pursue the topic as a matter of high priority at the multilateral level. The BMZ, the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, supports the UN Global Accelerator on Jobs and Social Protection, and we support the Global Shield against climate risks and in, it uses also the social protection as a tool for dealing with losses and damages. So expanding social protection systems and making them adaptive is becoming more and more challenging because the crises are putting more great strain on public budgets. But however, the opportunities offered by multilateral corporations are increasing too. That's the good news and that's why we are all here in Berlin. Um, this conference gives us a chance to share knowledge and build alliances, learn about best practices from our partner countries, and encourage players to take ownership and design their own systems. I really look forward to discussing with all of you, for instance, the question of how to make social protection 
more adaptive through digital technology, how to increase the gender transformative impact of basic social protection, how to make it possible for governments to mobilize enough revenue to finance minimum social standards, and I'm sure in the discussion in the panels on the upcoming days, there will be plenty of questions which are arising in the auditorium, in the auditory and uh, in your working groups. So I'm really having high expectations, or we have high expectations in this conference, and I'm looking very much forward to the results of that conference, which can then influence our politics wherever we have the possibility to make a difference. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your insights. Welcome to Berlin and welcome to this conference. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Mrs. Kofler. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, of course, there are co-hosts. And I'm very happy to uh, welcome here on stage uh, and actually roll out the red carpet. Mind you, that was rather easy since you're sitting on it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, by introducing her, I'd like to give a glimpse of the distinguished career uh, that uh, you've had at the World Bank, uh, Mamta Murti. Um, You've had many leadership positions, uh, ranging from directorates, engagement with EU and Africa, to global strategy and operations in infrastructure, then operations uh, policy. But today, you're joining us in your capacity as Vice President for Human Development at the World Bank, Mamta Murti. So nice that you are actually here. I know that you have a lot on your hands, that you have a lot in your portfolio, but two aspects are really relevant for the conference today. The global practices for education, health, nutrition, and population, gender, social protection, and jobs. <sighs> Quite a mouthful. And uh, as the Human uh, Capital Project. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give her a hand, Mamta Murti. Excellencies, um, distinguished guests, participants, it's a real pleasure for me to be here this morning in this beautiful city on a wonderful sunny day. Um, welcome to this global conference on uh, adaptive social protection. It's my great pleasure to be welcoming you here. Um, we, have, we are delighted to co-host this event. Uh, I've had a fantastic twin sister, if I may uh, say so, uh, uh, a twin sister in, in, uh, uh, in uh, um, BMZ, and, and uh, 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 we know that uh, the, the uh, commitment of Minister Schulze to this agenda is um, insurmountable. Um, I should also say that this is the first social protection and jobs event since COVID-19. I don't think I've seen so many people uh, in, in one room, and it was a real pleasure this morning to have all those informal interactions and, and um, uh, uh, conversations with people. I know we also have an audience online, uh, and it's a big audience, and I think this is testimony to the interest that people have in this topic. Um, that's why I really hope that we will use this time together uh, to, to discuss things that are very much on our minds, things that we have not been able to reflect on while we've been in, in our own spaces and, and all come together because there's a huge momentum behind this agenda of adaptive safety nets. Now, why is that? That's because we are living in a world of multiple overlapping crises. And it's very difficult to think of instruments that can support people to become more resilient, um, instruments other than um, adaptive social protection. And that's why at the World Bank, we are very committed to this agenda. And for us, uh, it means that everybody uh, has protection when they need it and where they need it. It means that everybody is protected in the face of shocks. And it also means that no individuals or groups are left behind. These are the principles that guide our work on adaptive social protection. We have a strategy. Uh, it's called Compass. And, and I hope this is something that you uh, will all have a chance to, to read and reflect on and, and give us your feedback. 
Um, and in supporting social protection, we, we really um, take this forward on three pillars. There are three elements of this which are extremely important to us. Um, first is equity, and that means everybody has access. The second is opportunity. It's extremely important that uh, adaptive social protection is the opportunity to give opportunity. It's used to build human capital, it's used to build skills, it's used to enhance productivity. And third, resilience. It's extremely important that social protection is a means through which people and governments acquire the capacity to manage uh, uh, the, manage the response to shocks and also to, um, to build for the future. Now, our commitment to this agenda is very strong and it's sort of hard to describe what this commitment means, so let me use a, a, a monetary figure because it's always easier to communicate things in, in, in monetary figures. The sum total of the work that we do on social protection covers uh, tens of countries. I would like to say it covers 100 countries because 100 is a nice round number, but I would say that it covers the, the, the high tens of countries. And we have a portfolio which is around 26 billion US dollars. Um, and it provides technical support and finance for, for governments to expand, build, and make more resilient the social protection systems that they have. Now, um, this is an agenda which is long-standing. It doesn't happen in a day. It will not happen overnight. It will take time to build. Um, uh, but it's one that we feel confident can and will make progress over time. We, are, we all know that countries are facing multiple shocks, and everybody is talking about climate these days. Um, the shock of, uh, uh, well, climate change is here. It's, it's just that we have repeated weather-related shocks. Um, it's very easy to talk about uh, social protection as something that is distinct from, from climate change. And in the global conversation, these things don't often come together. But if there's one idea that I want you to retain with you during these days and to take away with you, it's that adaptive social protection and climate action go together. They, they need to go hand in hand. Um, and this is for two reasons. First of all, uh, um, adaptive social protection helps responding to shocks, and that includes climate shocks. Um, and the second is, we can't really talk about decarbonization without talking about social protection, because there will be a need to support people as they move away from uh, carbon-intensive work to less carbon-intensive work. So we need to see these two agendas as strongly intertwined. Finally, I don't think this is something that can move forward, despite all the momentum in this room, uh, despite the fact that we've come together. I don't think this is something that can move forward without collaboration and partnerships. Collaboration and partnerships is, strength, is central to um, taking this work forward. And this means uh, partnership and collaboration across the government, private sector, civil society, academia, multilateral agencies like our own, the UN system, and, and broader than that. And so I really hope that we can take this opportunity to build and strengthen those partnerships uh, while we're here today and, and take this forward in the work that we do. With that, let me, let me stop, welcome you once again, and say that I'm really looking forward to the discussions over the coming days. Thank you. And Mamta, we're also going to see you very shortly uh, during the panel discussion uh, for further and in-depth uh, um, uh, statements. Uh, now, thank you very much uh, to both ladies for the pointing out of the interdependency of uh, both agenda and uh, actions. And ladies and gentlemen, just very briefly, and I know that you've all seen the program, let's have a quick look at the next three days. And uh, what uh, you should be seeing is uh, what's on our agenda. I'm not gonna go into it because basically you've had it on your phones. Maybe you've even got it printed out. So a cornucopia of offerings, ladies and gentlemen. And we have the four plenary sessions. Uh, we have 
uh, that are, of course, mirroring the building blocks uh, of adaptive social protection systems, um, as well as 12 parallel, session, uh, parallel sessions, a lot to do, and uh, you will actually experience uh, that later. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really, really happy to welcome the person who is going to sort of lay out uh, the red, green, white, and whatever color carpet uh, for us. He's setting the scene this morning. Uh, it is Stefan Delkon, who is Professor of Economic Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government and Economics uh, Department at the University of Oxford. Stefan, just wait a moment. I'm just going to do the honors before you actually come up here. Uh, so he's going to give us an eagle's view on the diverse aspects of uh, adaptive social protection system, what works, how it works, if it does, and what needs to be done to get social protection for all. Uh, Stefan unites uh, both academic and policy advisory roles apart from his professorship. He's director at the Center of uh, Study for African uh, Economies, was for many, many years chief economist uh, at the UK Department of International Development, DFID, which uh, you probably all know as well, and uh, he has advised uh, successive uh, UK foreign ministers on development cooperation. And the nice thing is uh, that he's not just sort of an academic, but he actually goes down on the ground. He talks talks to people and that influences the outcome of uh, his analysis. Uh, so he doesn't just meet prime ministers, civil servants, but also ordinary people. Um, you've, I think, lived in 40 old countries. Um, I'm just almost going to stop, but his last book was actually called Why in the Global Changes of the Last 30 Years Some Developed Countries Have Prospered While Others Have Failed. Of course, that wasn't the title. The title was called Gambling on Development. And there he takes a look at the development and why have some countries actually made more progress whereas others haven't. And one of the answers is, surprise, surprise, adaptive social protection. So, we're happy that you're here. I think I can't say any more because otherwise I'm stealing your time. Stefan Derkan, so nice you're here. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Okay. Good, good, good morning. Um, so, it's great to be here with what I think are our friends. Um, can I just actually check, is, who, who is here who likes adaptive social protection? Can you shout? <laughs> oh, okay, can you, okay, so, the, okay. Now, one of the problems of talking to a group like this, talking to the converted, is that you're all convinced about it. What is the point of someone come and talk to you and actually saying all is well, you know, fine, let's get on and go. Why do we spend two days here? Why don't we just go and do it? So, giving a keynote, I also will want to challenge you a bit. And I actually think that we are risking wasting opportunities that we have, and that actually we need to be willing to think a bit more carefully about what is it that actually we're trying to do? What does it mean when we try to build up systems? What do we mean when we try to build up social protection systems? What does it mean if we want to make them adaptive? What do we need to do? And I want to challenge you, but it's not in saying that, look, there is not already quite a lot to applaud, you know? It's one of the big things of the SDGs that, you know, for me also as a researcher on social protection, that we have an, an SDG 1.3 that actually talks about it. And it talks about systems. You know, do I smell a little bit or sense a little bit of German influence that for a long time always wanted to have systems thinking? Probably yes. But it's good. But systems require something more than programs. And you need to think a bit more about the system that you try to build. Now, what I want to talk to you is a little bit about the opportunity that we have. I think other speakers have alluded to it, and I will pick up on that as well. But I also will want to actually challenge you a little bit and actually just ask, really, are we approaching it in the right way? Are we thinking in the right way? Are we selling it in the right way? Are we trying to convince people in the right way in, in, this whole, in, in this respect? And then I do think that the default, if the default is that we do what we're doing now, I would actually suggest maybe we need to change that default a bit 
and we need to do somehow changing a little bit of how we step by, step by step think about it. Now, maybe at the end you'll say, oh, that's what we do anyway. Well, at least I want to challenge you that you actually, are we really? And are we doing it in that way? Now, briefly talk about the opportunities. The opportunities are amazing. And, and the one thing is really comes to do with what we know and with the experience we have. Okay, I'm, I often have to think back at one of my experiences, and this was evaluating social protection program in Western Kenya. And we were talking to a lady, and even before we could start asking her, you know, some of our questionnaire questions, she actually said, look, you know what is the nicest sound in the world? And she started saying, ping, ping, ping. And we looked all puzzled, and she said, it sounds like a raindrop falling on my tin roof. Ping, ping, ping. When the rains are coming in the beginning of the rainy season. That's the noise that my mobile phone makes when the cash transfer reaches. That's the nicest noise that I have in my life. And look, that's the kind of thing. You know, you have the beneficiary feedback. But for once, and let me say, for once in development, we don't have to just rely on the kind of stories we hear and tell and can publicize. We have lots of hard evidence. I think Mamta Murti was alluding to it already as well in terms of the evidence base we have. Actually, there is probably no program, no intervention that we have in development on which we have now more evidence. Social protection in general, probably more specifically around cash transfers. I was trying to do a Google Scholar search, and there was tens and tens of thousands of research papers now on the web that one way or another talk about cash transfers. And there's definitely hundreds now of very rigorous study that show us. And some of these results are well known. You know, it changes people's lives in education opportunities, in nutrition, of course, in consumption, in subjective well-being, in happiness result, in a whole broad series of things, you know, this actually this thing tends to work. It has a benefit. That's important because even, you know, we all have had the meetings and, the me and someone saying, yeah, but, you know, if you start giving them something like that, they're just going to drink it all. They're going to just smoke it all up. They're going to do bad things with it. We know that that's not the case. We have a strong evidence base that we can build on. And actually, even when we are applying it in unlikely settings, like in humanitarian settings, actually, by the way, we don't really have strong evidence there. You know, there's very little good, rigorous research in humanitarian settings. We'll talk a little bit more about it in a moment. But still, we do know from a lot of qualitative work, it does restore dignity of people as well. And so people that are in humanitarian crisis situation, refugee camps, transfers, cash transfers, rather than handouts in com complicated programs, that seems to help them a lot. And of course, a big part of this is the fact that we can do increasingly these things with digital transfers, okay? So, and, and you know, we know the drill, you know, digital transfers, brings down the costs of providing it, but also increases the accountability. There's a much clearer chain of, you know, who actually is getting the resources and so on. And, you know, we can do that once we work digitally, we can do quite remarkable things. And probably the most exciting study that I've probably ever, or definitely in the last few years, worked on was an evaluation of a flood response program by the World Food Programme in Bangladesh. This was the Yamuna River flooding in 2021. It was the second highest flood that I've, they have experienced. And because people had been pre-enrolled, and because they had digital wallets, Bcash, you know, from the BRAC family, they had Bcash wallets, we managed, working with them, getting cash transfers to the flood victims, not as typically is the case for a WFP program about 40 to 70 days after a crisis event. We managed to get it to them five days before the floods. Five days before the floods. By using the science, the hydrological mapping, the whole detailed study, and we knew 12 days before this moment, that the flood peak would happen at a particular moment. Because, of course, the Amuni River starts high up in the, in the Himalayas, and everything was modeled, and we could follow very carefully. And the precision was amazing. Five days before the floods, we could now reach them. 
Okay? We did an impact evaluation, very rare to have rigorous evidence relative to groups that couldn't be reached, that we knew beforehand were not yet enrolled. We basically could show that 50 days later, usually the day when WFP arrives, we still had consumption and nutrition levels that were better. We had half the probability that people were going uh, without a day of food during the crisis because of the intervention. And even five months later, these people were still better up with a very small cash transfer that we'd been able to give five days before the floods. And even better, talking about adaptive social protection, they could adapt, indeed, they could do preventative action. We know that people manage to get their livestock in safer places and so on with these resources. Now, there's amazing things you can do, okay? So these are the kind of things we can do. And of course, during COVID, we got a massive opportunity because a lot of people that doubted that this was important now can be convinced that it is, okay? This is, uh, uh, Ugo Gentilini's uh, and, and others at the World Bank's report. You know, if any of you don't read Ugo's uh, weekly links for social protection, what are you doing here? You know, <laughs> read every week his links. And basically, you can see how in that period that the cash transfers in pandemic times, you know, it was quite remarkable. 1.3 billion people were reached. Yes, maybe it could have been longer. It could have been maybe more than the four and a half months on average that we managed to get it, but this was a massive scale up. And the opportunity from actually getting into people's consciousness, these systems, more than just a program, these systems are important, that happened definitely there. However, and now I come actually saying, no, I'm going to bash myself a little bit here. You know, I'm a fan of these things, but I do worry a lot about how far we got to after all these decades of work around it. And so the first thing is we have to admit that when it comes to poorer countries, where probably the need was for social protection, actually, we managed to reach relatively few people, less than 10%. This is a picture from the, from the previous report I mentioned from the World Bank. Even your COVID, less than 10% of the population in low-income countries turned out to be covered by the programs, you know? It's something we managed to do pretty well in very rich countries and rich countries, but it actually was much, much, diff much more difficult in these places. The systems were not there, despite the fact that we for decades had talked about systems. The systems were not there to reach the people. But then probably also more importantly, with all the excitement we have by waving our phones around, it's so rare to have a digital system. System. No, no, that doesn't mean even in the way that we had to do it in Bangladesh, where we had one spreadsheet with the beneficiaries that had we been typed in, another press spreadsheet to actually get all the kind of the trigger somehow, and then we had to sign the way of matching that the right people were going to be reached. And then actually manually having to make sure that the payments were going to be processed. That's not a digital systems. We may well have digitally stored a lot of these things, and the last mile may have happened with the digital payment. That's a Swiss cheese with a lot of holes. That's basically a system that is not a system. That is little bits and pieces that we digitized, which is not a digital system. We are not quite there, because I remember at some point telling Mark Locke at the time, the humanitarian relief coordinator, and said, look, where you want to be at some point in your UN, in your nice UN office in the tower at the UN headquarters, is when there is a real crisis situation in a really difficult place, that you literally can press a button and the system will deliver the cash transfers into people's mobile phones. Now, anyone who's operated a system, I've seen systems where multiple computers sit next to each other, they have to look at each other and then something done there, done there and whatever. We have social registries stored in the most useless places, I'm sorry, we put them there, but you can't operate with them, you can't operate them, you can't update them and, and so on. So we don't have a system. And then, I do think we are not doing ourselves a, ser a service by trying to overstate what social protection can actually achieve. Okay, I find this quite important. I work on a lot of things in development. I'm a big fan. I've always started as a poverty researcher, looking at cash transfers, looking at social insurance, insurance things, all these kind of things. But we have to admit 
that there is not a single country that has reduced in a sustainable way extreme poverty without actually getting their economies to grow. Now, we don't really want to, in the end, keep on wanting to prove that a social protection thing will have so much externalities that suddenly growth as by magic will appear in a country. That's not how change happens in countries. Social protection is crucial, but actually we see it most effective in countries where other stuff is happening. You know, it's not for nothing that Bangladesh has endless cases of all forms of social protection by NGOs and by government having big success, because it helps if you have 6.5% of growth for 25 years. It's a great force for inclusion. It doesn't solve in a kind of permanent way the kind of poverty situation. Now, it does great things. Again, the evidence is strong, but it's not the silver bullet. And don't try to present it like this, because it doesn't help to be credible, including, I would say, in a World Bank building where all the others are saying, yeah, they do their stuff, but we know that this is the big stuff. No, no, you want to get clear about your place and don't overstate, especially, I would say, the evidence that we have. By the way, the evidence is very positive, but it's not a miracle, it's not a magic bean, it's not this massive thing. You want to have it in every society that you want to be inclusive, where people can take advantage of opportunities, but you don't make it that end all as if it's the, the end of poverty in itself defined. It's getting quieter already, good. <laughs> and finally, think about politics. If I've one thing I've learned coming from academia 10, time, 10 years then sitting into different and later on in FCDO, trying to advise some, um, okay, dodgy foreign ministers like Dominic Raab and Liz Truss, basically, don't underestimate politics. Politics in donor countries. You know, we can say the evidence is there that it can work. But I know full well, having sat there in DFID and then afterwards in FCDO in the UK, that actually it's a really hard sell, often even to our own taxpayers. And it's not for nothing when DFID was abolished, that in the speech in Parliament, Boris Johnson, remember this strange man, um, that Boris Johnson gave a speech where he basically said, imagine what DFID was doing. They were doing cash points in the sky, and which was his description of an extremely carefully designed program in Pakistan, the Benazir Income Support Program, where technical support was given to get digital payments going. That was cash points in the sky. It's quite hard when you work as an advisor in a department and you see the main newspaper that, is ra the ra that rallies that part of, uh, of the population using that title and describe that's the work you do. Can you, can you see it? So the, the whole idea that this is self-evident, you know, even in our own societies, that kind of work still often needs a battle and so on. Now, why do I mention Boris Johnson? Not because that's particularly important. The same happens in the countries we try to build up social protection systems. You can't say that you've never come across a minister in a developing country that's saying, do you really think we should be giving cash to poor people? I definitely have heard them saying, oh, well, not all of them. Many are amazing. But some have said, the poor are just lazy. We just have to accept to that. You know, we're not going to hand out things. Or maybe we should recognize, for example, when in Latin America, when cash transfers became first to the fore, they had to be conditional, not because some research had said that conditional was brilliant. By the way, it works. But because it was the only way to get it through the parliaments of these countries, that actually conditions had to be put on the poor because we wouldn't trust them that they would otherwise use the money well. So we have to be conscious of this local political context. In many countries, also in Africa, you will actually get social protection schemes that are clearly seen by politicians as a form of clientelism. I basically pay people as a form of vote buying. Not for nothing, we see all over the world these programs beginning and then ending, coming back and changing and so on. I remember research in India where actually we were dealing in one village with 27 programs we could call social protection and all named after a politician. This is 10 years ago, but that's part of it. We should recognize that even in these countries, the sale has to happen. 
So it's not about the social contacts. So I'm going to end now by actually giving you three things that I think we need to begin to think better about to actually really build systems. Going away from programs, trying to think about how you build systems. And the first one is anything and everything in development in any country in the world starts with political commitment. Okay, that's the theme of the book that, thank you for plugging it, it's still available everywhere. It's no German translation, by the way, yet. Why, why is there no publisher doing this? Anyway, the, um, is the book where basically fundamentally I, I, I want to emphasize that difference between countries that are successful or not has a lot to do with not one minister wanting something or one president or one prime minister, but somehow a form of an elite consensus of key people in society in politics, often also in opposition, in uh, government, in business, in the military, in academia, that actually see this. That political will needs to be there. And we have to be recognized that it's not always very clean. Political opportunism by promoting an agenda will be there. Clientelism is part of democracies all over the world. Basically, clientelism meaning that you want to reward your constituents for providing you with votes, maybe even with contracts. We should recognize that Bossa Familia could only really come about actually because of the conditions attached to it as well. Otherwise, it would have been very hard to get it going. Secondly, is that we need to change the default. We need to build not somehow a digitized analog system where our little forms get typed in a computer and then we link a little bit more. We should start thinking about it, you know? We should actually talk about G2P, as the techie people would talk, uh, government to people transfers, and to actually build that system. You know, it's not about handing on some phones and so on doing it, but thinking, can we actually get a digital system? I think actually these days for social protection, it's more important that, for example, digital public infrastructure gets rolled out so that we can actually use this for social protection than that we try to digitize our social protection systems we have at the moment. What do we mean by these digital public goods? It's, for example, what was happening in India. And it has uncomfortable things for some of you here. You know, ID matters because we want to target at some point our support properly. ID will matter. UPI, uh, universal payment interface, will matter. You know, I'm not, I think M-Pesa did great things, but how much more innovation can we get from a proprietary system? I don't know, it's a private proprietary system. So you want actually a much more public system. Can we actually start thinking like, in the case of India Stack, how to do it? And then finally, we need to also change the default on finance. We can't keep on dreaming up ever more sophisticated, perfect systems of social protection. I'm still traumatized by a calculation I did at some point for a DFID program in northern Nigeria, where it was a beautiful design program for, for young children and, and mothers, cash transfers, maternal health, everything, social protection. But then to come to the realization, if we want the government ever to do it itself, then the state government would have to spend 70% of its budget on that particular program. That was just dreamland. We shouldn't design systems because we want them perfect. We want actually systems that in due course can be sustainable in countries, and then it has to become from what can be financed. And then we think about what other things can we bring in it. And it can't be, oh, let's start it hopefully in three years we get some extra money. But we have to think about pre-agreed finance, whether it's to actually increase the funding when shocks are happening, or indeed other forms of providing support in crisis situations, that's how we do it. It's tax plus pre-agreed finance, and not design a system, and I'm begging to see whether a donor will pay it for a little bit. So that's basically where we get to, is that we actually want to have a system that fits the local context, and yes, it will involve the politics, a digital system, not simply digitized analog system, and a system designed with affordability and sustainability within the country in mind. And that seems to be important. And then we can actually get a resilient system that then maybe we can build properly adaptive, properly anticipatory, responsive to it. But if we want to do these things at scale, we need to do these things properly. And for me, what we haven't quite properly done is focusing on the plumbing, the political plumbing, the digital plumbing, the financial plumbing, can we actually set these things up? 
So stop dreaming of excellent programs and sophisticated programs, but start working much more on the plumbing. Thank you very much. For later. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, Stefan, uh, fascinating as always, uh, lots of energy there. And, and let me just sort of uh, kick off with what you said last. Um, you know, design completely new, have those three aspects in mind, but I'm sorry. Every country has hereditary systems. Uh, every country has actually your last picture. I mean, whether north or south. Uh, so, how do we get about it? We don't have a clean, uh, clean starting point. Right. No, we of course never have a cl clean starting point and we actually are, are starting where we're starting. But let's not underestimate, you mentioned Africa, how limited sometimes these systems are at the moment. Or even countries like for example in Ethiopia with the Productive Safety Net program, it's becoming quite unaffordable. And in fact, we start seeing the pressures on that system increasingly happening, that it keeps on being largely dependent on outside funding, and they can't quite, quite, doing, uh, quite, quite, quite get, get, uh, get it going. Now, I don't want to take the rights away from the people that actually at the moment receiving it, but it is about redesigning mm -hmm. how you actually reach them. I think India is quite interesting. The programs itself have not necessarily changed. I, I'll take that last from yeah. you. I can't see that. Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit no, of a mum. No, that's good, good. <laughs> the, the, so, so, so think of India, where the, system, the programs itself, and Rega and other, as other programs haven't changed, but you built it within now, you reincorporate it into a, into a digital system mm. to actually do it. And it's somehow to need to think about it, because the digital plumbing is there, mm -hmm. and then we can improve the system. So this is the difference between digitizing an existing thing and bringing little bits and pieces, and every system will be different, than compared to actually saying, work on the plumbing, and then bring back the, the, the programs into it. You know, look, even in our own countries, the way we do our systems has totally changed. But it doesn't mean that the rights of people have been taken away to certain benefits. Mm -hmm. But it's come from a system that begins to operate and then we can bring the rights back into it rather than trying to uh, endless little programs of, oh, let's digitize this little one and, 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 coming, uh, and, and then progressing in that way. Um, we, of course, are, are sitting in this sort of kind of context because, um, of course, we have uh, the German ministry, uh, we have the World Bank, and uh, then we have also the country's uh, representatives uh, where systems are working. Now, it's always a question like, what is this assistance that we're talking about uh, supposed to look like? Okay, fine, we have changed, uh, we have changed the theme, you know, it's, it's all got to be sort of eye to eye and uh, uh, with a lot of respect, but still, what are the essences of cooperation that really work, that you've seen? So, so the essence of cooperation, it has to start from real local ownership. You know, we often come with our design plans from outside and we'll try to bring it and actually uh, look at it. Now, you know, this is uncomfortable at times as well because there's places where you feel like you hit a wall, you can't quite do it. But simply then to actually say, oh, well, I'm going to ignore the wall and I'm actually going to stay out. Actually, a lot of development cooperation has to be also trying to convince and persuade Evidence is one part of it, I'm afraid politics is another part of it, making it sound and making having a narrative in these countries how it can be used as well, but that's where you do it. Now in countries where there is a commitment to do these things, you know, just full-blown give them the support. You know, it may not be the perfect system from what you want to have in mind in doing it, but these countries where fundamentally those in power committed to do development and make social protection part of it, you know, allow them to own it. It may not be the perfect system, but it will be, it's more chance that this system will be sustainable so that the next minister, when they come in, they won't try to abolish it and then they, they, they will change it. So for us, a bit of humility in terms of how we approach them. A bit of humility in saying, look, 
We are not the ones from here, rooms like this, that we can change these countries, but we can support them and you can promote them and you can strengthen what they actually want to do themselves. I, I see a lot of smiles in the audience, uh, just to, uh, for the online audience, uh, so there seems to be a lot of support for that. Um, uh, on the way to the last question, I have one in, in between. I mean, the, the title of your book is, of course, you know, challenging, gambling. But what do you actually mean by gambling? Who has to gamble? Who are the players? Right. So, um, so in the book, I, I, I basically make it in a simplified way, just as a way of, as a framework. You know, there are some countries where an elite is actually, seems to be progressively uh, doing actions that are consistent with growth and development, and others are not. But one of the things we learn from history is for those people that have power, it actually is a bit of a gamble to actually go for development. Because once we see countries developing and growing, you see changing structures of power, who has actually control. And even in our own countries, uh, you see other groups coming up. The gamble is somehow from those people who have power today to actually choosing a route of growth and development relative to the status quo, which they know well, which they know how to manipulate, which they know how to function well in it. There's a second gamble, that's people like us in the international community that is committed to development. We should not uh, let the perfect stand in the way of the good. Countries that give a sense of, look, they want to actually try something, to, to, to do something. It may not be the perfect C, uh, system as we design it in our ministries or in our academic world but actually gamble a bit that they're actually trying to really do the very best also what would work in their countries and support them and give them advice, give them strength in their, their positions and so on doing it. So it's a gamble from us, but it's also gambles in the countries themselves because the status quo is very comfortable for those people who are in power in all developing countries. Yeah. And that's also we should help those players that want to progress to give them the support to make that progress. So the carrot is more in the head. Okay, um, how can we leverage adaptive social protection efforts to achieve uh, SDG 1.3? Um, and of course, and we've, we've talked about it several times, we've heard it in, in uh, all the uh, um, opening speeches, we do have a couple of other problems out there. Yeah. Look, one of the things is, and, and, and Forgive me if I sound like a record that's a bit stuck. We have to start from what locally the commitment can be. I actually think in virtually any country in the world, you know, whether that we politically like them or not, there is often a commitment to do somehow getting some basic systems, systems going. So the one thing we should be willing to do is to actually help these things, and for SDG 1.3, is scale. Scale is what we're lacking. It's not good programs, it's scale. And the world is really scale, so can we actually do this? My experience working in the digital spaces, that every country in the world, every president, prime minister, every opposition leader likes to be associated with the digital side because a little bit of a photo opportunity with a tech guy is really helpful. It's your entry point to actually build also the systems for social protection. We know that Countries that are currently asking, for example, some of the, the engineers involved in the India system, in Africa, several countries are asking their advice. It's very striking that they mainly ask their advice for G2P systems, government to people transfer systems. That's our entry point. That's where we should strengthen. That's where we could give support. And then use this plumbing that's being developed to actually get proper social protection systems that are adaptive to develop. Thank you so much. Uh, as always, fantastic. And ladies and gentlemen, please give him a big hand. Stefan. You, you, can take the, you can take the microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, and this is a time to actually uh, resound a couple of uh, uh, the points that Stefan's made, but also uh, their country experiences, their, ca their experiences uh, in their long observation and doing. Uh, and uh, don't be astonished, the panel is all 
female, um, which is a pro, uh, and uh, <laughs> this was just an early thing. We, we're going to discuss a couple of sort of the background questions, like um, uh, the central role of social protection we've heard, but I mean, how do you actually sort of do it? Um, we hear from Germany, we hear from uh, uh, Egypt, um, we have uh, uh, the World Bank experiences with their many tools and uh, uh, aspect, the global initiative for economic, social and cultural rights, for example. And um, what are the key lessons learned? What are their views? So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to start by asking the two ladies that you've already gotten to know to come back up on stage. Uh, that is Bärbel Kofler and, uh, of course, uh, Mamta Nurti. Uh, please do come back uh, of the World Bank, of course, and uh, I think you have been sort of assigned certain seats, like right in the middle, fantastic. Um, and I'd like to give a, a big uh, welcome and a warm welcome to uh, um, Her Eminence Ninivi uh, al Khabak, uh, Minister of Social Solidarity uh, Egypt. Very fascinating, your biography. All steps depending, uh, deepening your experience in the field of international cooperation, strategic management, and institutional development. Maybe you'd like uh, to come to my right side. Ten years working with UNICEF on development frameworks, especially on women and children issues, and I think we're going to touch upon that in a moment. Uh, you joined the government of Egypt first as Deputy Minister of Social Solidarity for Social Protection and Development, uh, and now, of course, you're the Minister of Social Solidarity, and you've been out now for three years. Thank you very much for having come here. I'd like to fill up... Yes, you can give them applause. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Too fast. And to give uh, a complete view, I'd like to invite the Executive Director of the Global Initiative for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights to come up on stage, Dr. Magdalena Sepulveda, um, and uh, also a uh, long, wonderful uh, CV, but I'm just going to shorten it uh, to the fact that you're probably uh, one of the tax people uh, uh, around. Um, uh, nobody likes taxes, but we all lo love Magdalena, um, uh, but of course, uh, tax uh, um, uh, related to issues of poverty, development, and human rights. Um, uh, and uh, you've been uh, the executive director of GIESCR uh, for quite a number of years. And also, and with that, I actually sort of sit down as well. Um, you've been um, uh, thereby, by having that role, you're also a member of the Global Coalition for Social Protection Floors, which of course is very important. So, a uh, big round of applause. <laughs> now, forgive me, I usually make shorter questions, but this is going to be sort of a, a longish one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Niveen, um, uh, we've heard about the crisis, uh, we've heard about the highlight uh, of the gaps in the system, um, and um, already in 2015, Egypt has established two new cash transfer programs. Um, please sort of enlighten us a little bit of how that works. Um, and um, also, these programs are, I mean, how, how important are they as a backbone? Secondly, the question is, and um, in, in your repertoire, of course, uh, the look at the situation of women and children has always been a central one. Um, so how does it actually tie into each other? Does it at all? Um, and looking at our panel here, uh, without the female look at things, can we change things at all? Okay, fine. That was almost a philosophical question. So please take it away. Just very quickly, rule of the games. Everybody has around about five minutes. So um, you have all the time in the world. All the five minutes. <laughs> okay, good morning, everybody. And it's a great pleasure to be with you today. And it's an honor to be in such a distinguished panel. Uh, um, uh, speaking about social protection, we do believe that social protection should start with um, um, uh, systems, uh, structures, uh, with success in a clear vision and not only responsive but adaptive and having a longer term vision uh, to having more to be peoples oriented and in the meantime realistic with the government's budget. And so uh, I think we started in 2015 with, uh, it started with the cash but ended up with the system because 
because the, it came in accordance with the economic reform that the country was undergoing and having the subsidy reform system. So it was planned with a political commitment in order to have social justice, especially the social justice was one of the main requests of the two revolutions that took place. So it was a new social contract between the, the government and the people and that's why it was built on a strong MIS system, and it was the first time to do it in Egypt to have a strong MIS system built on ID numbers and having a robust database that includes quite comprehensive set of socioeconomic data that allows for targeting and that allows to put the PMT at any time flexi as possible and having ongoing registration in spite of not necessarily having all of the people in, but having the registration ongoing. And that's allowed to have a, a big database of 10.5 million households, summing up to around 40 million individuals. Although we are supporting, uh, at that time, at the beginning of COVID, we had uh, covered 3.2 million households. During COVID and post-COVID, we increased with an amount uh, with uh, the beneficiaries, with 2 million beneficiaries, to reach 5.2 million households, summing up to around 20 million. That, that means that around 40, 50%, 52% of the poor are covered. But it came out with a click of a button, is that when we wanted to increase the beneficiaries, the beneficiaries were automatically added. Uh, so it helped us to increase the beneficiaries with 63%. And eventually, the budget also was increased um, from um, uh, 12 million billion to 19 billion to 31 billion at the end. So it nearly doubled uh, the budget. And then it grew up to have 800% of the budget increase since the source of the program in 2015. Uh, I think it's not only the, the systems and the automated system, but the linkage between the Ministry of Social Solidarity and other partners that are having interventions on social protection not necessarily cash, but with a wider vision. It's not cash transfer, it's a comprehensive social protection system. So that we're, we were interlinked with the Ministry of Supply, where the beneficiaries also used to have uh, food subsidy and bread subsidy added to the cash, and even more, because we have the beneficiaries of the food subsidy much bigger than the cash transfer. So, but all the beneficiaries having uh, under Tekeful and Karama have food subsidy and bread subsidy as well. Uh, also, our linkage with the Ministry of Health to have them health insurance, to have them included under health insurance, uh, interlinkage with Ministry of Education to have free education for the five million children under um, the, the, who are taken care by the households covered by social protection program. Um, we, we were also linked with Azhar universities, Azhar schools in order to have all kind of education covered. Uh, I think also building a network with NGOs and religious institutions through the Zakat uh, institutions and the NGOs because they are providing a lot in Egypt, not necessarily some of them are providing cash, others are providing food, uh, clothing, uh, medication, lots of services that maybe are uncalculated and under, uh, underseen. So what we're trying to do is to build a unified national registry that is administered by the Administrative Control Authority and to have this check on trimestral basis every three months to run the databases. I think also having, the, uh, speaking about digitization, we developed a system for, to, to register people with disabilities, having the medical and functional assessment, because the system, there was lots of wastes before the system was being automated, but after having the system settled between us and the Ministry of Health, it's much more governed. It's not at its best situation yet, but at least we have 1.2 million uh, people with disabilities covered with Karama uh, for, we also included the orphans and the children without care. So there were interlinkage between social protection and social care to include the vulnerable groups. I think building communication between us and communities was very important and that's why we brought uh, free lines for all the beneficiaries of the Kefal and Karama because the poor frequently change their phone lines. They go for the packages and they change so they cannot reach them easily. So if you have millions and having the rapid pro mechanism 
uh, which was well, supported by uh, UNICEF, supported by the World Bank. Actually, the World Bank started uh, with us since the early starts of the program. Uh, I think having this line of communication between us and between uh, the uh, beneficiaries was very important. Uh, also, the, the digitization helped us to reach the casual workers because during the time of COVID-19, we covered around 5 million uh, persons, ca casual workers. We have in Egypt 52% only covered with a social pension, but we have 48% are out of the contributory social pension. And that's why having the digitization system and the electronic payment helped us to reach the casual workers. Uh, social pension, of course, was uh, released automated, but we increased the amount of social pension with 120%, and we increased also the amount with the political decision during the time of economic crisis. Uh, and finally, I think also uh, we succeeded uh, to, 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 to build uh, some sort of linkage uh, with the, the international organizations and building up partnerships. Uh, World Bank took the lead at the beginning and continued with us in terms not only of the loans, but also with technical support. But we have other organizations helping us, whether UN, UN agencies, the USAID, FAO, and so on. The last thing that we, we were very keen to develop in accordance with social protection is economic empowerment mm -hmm. because we see the transformative side of it and not only to be reactive at the time of crisis but to be ad responsive adaptive to emergencies and to poly crisis but also to be transformative at a certain point and that's why we developed FORSA and I have my colleague Dr. Atif Shabrayu is leading the program actually FORSA is an opportunity in, in English which means that we avail uh, especially micro enterprise asset production, rehabilitation courses for people in order to graduate. So we started the program with a graduation eye on the longer term and how we, can, we should economically empower people and invest in human capital. Before I end up my, my word, only one minute to highlight why women are mostly affected with the, the risks and with different types of crisis. Women are mostly working in an informal sector, are bearing the cost of the care economy, are being the domestic chorus, fetching water. So all the things, you know, are, they, they have double burdens, especially if you're speaking about rural areas and Eastern societies and especially women with disabilities and so on. So they bore the cost actually of it. And that's why the program specified that the SIM cards have to be released under the name of the women. And it was actually a transformative vision in Egypt to have the, the women having the, the smart cards, releasing the, the money by herself, taking the decision. 74% of the cards are under the names of the women, only under the name of men. If he is the caretaker of children or if they have disabilities or, or, or something like that. In addition, we develop programs for their family planning. Family, actually, population growth in Egypt is becoming to be problematic that is eating the fruits of development and that's why during the time of crisis and even after we availed family planning tools for free and sometimes we send it to their homes in order to make it easier for them we started with uh, implementation of first thousand days in the lives of children to protect the, the pregnant and lactating mothers especially at their vulnerable time because with the economic crisis actually they were receiving the least and and finally, we have mechanisms for protection of women against violence mm. through the helpline because I think it's global that during the time of COVID-19, they survived violence um, uh, uh, events and violence statements that we all believe in. Thank you very much. And I have to stop here. Yes, please. Uh, no, no, no. You keep, you keep the microphone. Yes. But uh, thank you very much uh, for the energy that uh, you sort of uh, portrayed everything that was done. And uh, what I take for you is, um, apart from something that is mirrored everywhere, uh, feminist development, uh, policy, uh, new concept, but um, uh, old ideas. So, uh, but cooperation and communication are core uh, to the system. Madalena, um, the Global Coalition for Social Protection Floors calls for a new financing mechanism. Uh, 
uh, now the, the, there are many calls for financing mechanisms, uh, but you want to mobilize uh, funding based on international solidarity to support the expansion of social production force. Now, with a view of climate change, with a view of uh, many other international um, aspects that draw attention, uh, how do you actually sort of put across the idea and where do you expect the money to come from? Well, thank you very much for this question. Uh, I would like to, to clarify from the beginning that civil society organization, trade unions, um, and human rights monitoring bodies have been calling for a financial mechanism for social protection for more than a decade. Mm. So in 2008, after the global financial crisis, uh, there's been this movement, uh, particularly strong from human rights organizations where I come from, that has been calling for this. In 2008, for example, I was the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, and together with my colleagues, the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, we call for a global fund on social protection. Um, if this call would have been taken seriously, um, the, the catastrophic impact of COVID would have been diminished, in particular in low-income countries. So this is not new. Um, I think that COVID and the multiple crises that we're living in has brought a sense of urgency, and that is very important. So the Global Coalition for Social Protection Floors started, which in his uh, foundational meeting already in 2012, already supported a mechanism for financing social protection. And now after COVID, it has made statements really uh, indicating what would be this minimum requirements for uh, such a mechanism. And this, uh, again, it's, it's very important, and I would like to highlight some of this requirement very briefly. Uh, it requires, for example, the minimum requirement that civil society is calling for now is complete ownership by recipient countries uh, of the resource protection system. Uh, the involvement of national government in the decision on how funding allocation should take uh, place an inclusive governance mechanism. And this is extremely important. Meaningful and effective participation, not only consultation from civil society organization in the decisions of the funds. And also, and most importantly to finalize, that any mechanism or the governance of any financial mechanism should be aligned with existing social security standards. And here I'm referring not only to the ILO, very important ILO social security standard, Convention 102, and also social, and the rec uh, recommendation 202, but I want to stress as well the human rights standards, the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, almost 75 years old, it's going to become in December, already status the importance of social protection. The right to social security is included there because we knew after the Second World War that social protection is the basis for inclusive and just society. And there are many international treaties that states have voluntarily assumed, such as the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, International Covenant, more than 170 state parties that enshrine the right to social security and many other rights like the right to health, the right to education with very specific components. So these are critical. So we need to move ahead. We cannot wait for the next crisis or the next pandemic to strike. We need to be right now acting with a sense of urgency and and that is why this meeting is very important and the leadership of germany is also very important we need to move ahead we need to implement a financial mechanism with inclusive governance now in order to prevent the accumulative impact that people living in poverty and those who have increased the number of those living in extreme poverty are suffering now 
Uh, thank you so much, and thank you also for sticking uh, to time. From now on, we've got to be a bit more conscious uh, uh, on time, uh, Bervel. Um, we, we've heard from, uh, from Stefan just a, uh, a moment ago, digital, adaptive, and local, uh, are sort of uh, two in, uh, three ingredients uh, that are essential. I'm quite sure uh, that you have a couple of examples uh, of German Development Corporation where that already falls into place. Uh, yes, we have examples. Yeah, it's it's working. It's working yeah, it's yeah. Working. So we have examples on that. I come to that. Um, but first, I also would reflect a little bit on the sentence that we shouldn't wait for a perfect system, bring from abroad to the the local communities or to various partner countries. Uh, first thing I would say, there is no perfect system. That's the, the experience from our own system, which is about more than 150 years uh, from starting now. And of course, we cannot transfer our system to other countries because it's a traditionally grown system. It's based on a formal uh, economy. You were pointing that out really perfectly. We have to attra uh, attract and uh, address the informal sector. So we cannot simply cope our system and, and bring it to somewhere else. Uh, what we are doing and what we are trying is to support governments around the globe who are on the track to come up with ideas on social protection on their own. Uh, and also coming up with ideas um, on financing. So I'm totally with you, don't get me wrong. I think there is a lot of need for global financing in this sector, don't get me wrong. But there's also a need for uh, empowering uh, governments to come up with own financial systems and with own financial thinking and how to support, and it's maybe not very sexy, but how to support tax systems starting with the uh, revenue in various countries to really rise this amount. Um, that is something very important to use it then for, for example, social protection in the cases or in the ways the countries define this need for themselves. So I think that's something what we would like to support and what we are doing and where we're having examples for. Um, starting with the tax system, uh, we have various countries where we support also with digitalization to rise the, the income, uh, the revenues, because it's at the end of the day, if you do it digitalized, it's more clear, it's more transparent, it's not so easy to sneak out of the system and don't pay the taxes or misuse the taxes, so it can also be a, a tool on transparency, and it's really raising the income source then of countries, and that has then to be used uh, for social protection. And there, also digitalization can play a systematic role. I also underline it. It's not about a project; it's about a systematic role. I was in the, my beginning remarks talking about Cambodia, where we were starting with a uh, digital program, which really is there to sign to transfer the money the country is offering for social protection to the people to give access to everybody in the country, not to the beneficiaries of one project. That's an important thing. Uh, of course, you can do that not alone as a country. You need World Bank, you need ILO, you need global partners from the UN level. You need the commitment of the local governments. And we have more than 65, uh, we have 65 partner countries at the BMZ, and we are doing negotiations every year or every second year. And we are doing it on systematic issues on social protection also. I have been to a lot of countries where there is the idea growing to come up with, like you were pointing out for Egypt, coming up with social uh, security or social protection systems on their own. And our duty then is, I think, to be aside those countries and help when it's needed with technical assistance, with our experience we had. We have, for example, with Bangladesh, uh, we were starting last year, um, a first kind of social insurance, but uh, not a private one, but one by the government for the textile sector, at least for those workers who are in working in the big textile sectors. It's not perfect. It's not reaching everybody until now, but it is a systematic approach because it's reaching um, the whole government issue. It's clarifying who is paying for it. It's at the end of the day then protecting people, for example, by accidents happening like mm. uh, Rana Plaza. We recently had the 10 year. So people are protected then and getting uh, um, help 
financial support in the case of accident. But it's not a project, it's a systematic approach mm. um, to, to build up social security systems in the countries. And that's something we, we support vital and we want to support vital and we want to do it more. We do it with digitalization. I was mentioning Cambodia, there we are, we are supporting um, free open source information system, that's called IMIS in that case. So we're doing that, that it's really then to tackle all the people to reaching the vulnerable ones. To reach in then especially, uh, was already said, also women and girls, because of course they are the most vulnerable ones. Uh, and the mostly women-led households are the ones mostly in need. So we need to uh, track uh, them. Of course, digitalization is a big tool to help. We always have to keep in mind that there is still also a digital gap. Mm. And we have to overcome that. It has to do with the access to energy, for example. There are so many things about that, but also has to do with education formation on that sector. There are many, many topics mm -hmm. aside that. But um, yeah, that's what, what we really want to do. And um, also support the ideas which are developed in countries how to really reach the informal sector. I think that is so crucial for social security to reach the informal sector. Yeah. I was last year in Morocco, which is also coming up with plans on that. Um, and I had talks with the finance minister, they are also a woman. So <laughs> it might help sometimes. Um, and uh, the, this country is coming up with their own ideas how to finance it, how to uh, come up with business cards and things like that to attract people who are in the informal sector and to build up benefits for them. And that's actually what we want to support. We are not the one who are doing everything or deciding everything that should be done on the ground. Thank you so much uh, uh, for that input and the outlook uh, and the description. Um, uh, Mamta, um, uh, the World Bank uh, has a social protection and jobs compass and uh, there you put priority on an additional aspect uh, of the vision for social protection. Now. Um, you're talking about economic inclusion, you talk about more effective labor systems, uh, we, we have the key word of opportunity gap now. Remember that you just mentioned that one of your programs is actually called opportunity. Uh, very important, I think the wording is also, you know, you can't just sort of say a poor system. Um, so how do you actually see the future after the last decade where we dragged our feet, how, how can we get traction? Um, so thank you very much, uh, f uh, Connie, for that question. I, I am also going to begin by reflecting on the conversation up to now. Um, and the way I think of social protection and adaptive systems is as a tool, as a very important tool in the government's toolbox. Right. It's not the only tool, right? And I, I'd like to uh, ref um, mention that um, uh, Santiago Levy, who is the Minister of Social, former Minister of Social Security in, in Mexico and the father of Oportunidades, right? The mm -hmm. big program in Mexico. He, uh, was, he often says this. He says, um, it was great that we had the program. It got all kids into school, but the Mexican economy wasn't really able to generate jobs for these kids. So if you talk about sustainable poverty reduction, it's not just Oportunidades, which was very important. It, it's all the other things that need to go uh, hand in hand. Um, so I, I think we need to keep that in mind. Uh, safe social protection, adaptive social protection as a tool, but, but not, not the uh, end in itself uh, and not something that can perform on its own. Um, and, you know, very important points were made about financing. Uh, I, it is the case that most low-income countries uh, spend uh, far too little uh, in my view, on, on uh, um, social protection. And they have multiple, they have limited domestic resource mobilization and, and they have multiple needs, right? Um, so like, like, uh, uh, like Barbel was saying, uh, uh, we need to emphasize domestic resource mobilization. We also need to emphasize uh, prioritization and, and reducing spending on, on uh, wasteful things. I think that can be a very important source of resources for, for um, social protection. And then, of course, I think there needs to be money uh, coming in from the outside, uh, certainly in the short term, 
to, to start building the systems, supporting system development to support cash uh, payments, which over time need to become the responsibility of national governments. Now, um, where do we see things going in, in, to come to your question, where do we see things going in, in the coming years? Well, we, we like to talk about five gaps uh, um, in social protection systems. Uh, um, uh, and we really see that the effort needs to be to close these five gaps. And it will take time. It will not happen overnight. Um, the first is the coverage gap, and, and which is that the majority of the poor are not covered by social protection. I mean, it exists to cover the poor, and the majority are not covered. So that's a gap that needs to be covered. Um, the second, and this has to do with financing, right? This has to do with making sure that more domestic resources are, are uh, collected, and this is, this is prioritized. So that's the financing gap. Um, but let me mention three other gaps which are very important. Um, uh, and, and, uh, the, uh, and this is where I come to opportunity, uh, the opportunity gap. The purpose of the social protection system is to, to provide a floor, but it's also to be a springboard to opportunity, to, uh, to support access to jobs. And, and this is where the minister talked about Forza, which is an element of, of their program. And, and that's something that increasingly social protection programs work on and, and that we support countries to do. And this means connecting people to the market, connecting people to jobs, uh, providing skills, including digital skills. This is a very important part of, of the program. Um, you know, it can be very small scale. Uh, in Niger, which is a country where the programs are heavily studied, um, we're talking about very small sums of money that are provided to people, uh, typically women. Uh, and um, in a rural area in Niger, you might, take, you might receive this money, you might go to the neighboring small town. It allows you to buy something in the market, you come back and you, you sell it in your, in your local village and you make a small profit with which you go and buy some more materials from the town. So that's kind of uh, helping somebody become um, uh, more productive and, and stand on her own feet. Uh, when you meet the beneficiaries of these programs, and I had the opportunity to do that uh, last year, you should see what a transformation in their life it is. Mm. So, so that's the kind of gaps from, from receiving resources to connecting to a market, from st uh, to starting your own business, that's the gap that that social protection programs need to fill. And then let me mention the last two things very quickly. Uh, flexibility, programs need to be a lot more flexible uh, because they have to respond to changing uh, circumstances. We call this the flexibility gap. And then finally, um, the delivery, and that's the system part, right? Being able to deliver uh, at scale. So. I would see um, social protection programs the world over moving to fill these five gaps, right? Uh, um, uh, uh, coverage, financing, opportunity, flexibility, and system development. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for taking us through uh, the framework so systematically. Um, and um, Minister, uh, if, if I may sort of um, ask a question that we're probably all asking ourselves is, uh, at what point and why do governments say this is the right road to embark on? And um, it must have sort of started um, around about 2014, because if you started in 2015 with these um, uh, two big programs, um, it of course takes a time. Um, it seems to have been a shift. Uh, new priorities were set. Um, women were seen in a, in a much more different way. And I believe actually the example that you said uh, was actually making headlines, certainly in the development community everywhere. So what has happened? Um, I think the vision of the government was um, to link the ma microeconomy with the macroeconomy. And we always think of social protection. Sometimes we are reacting to some sort of economic policies that might have taken a different road, and then we bear the consequences of these economic reform programs. It could be taken on the right sense of having them aligned together since the beginning. And that's what exactly happened in Egypt, is that the economic reform 
reform program was going along in, in a constant manner. But unfortunately, with the advent of COVID-19, followed by the Ukraine um, and uh, Russian war, it doesn't mean that it, um, it, is, it, it fell down, but I mean, it is struggling. Uh, at the beginning, it was not the case, and that's why the government was pro-social protection, but increasing numbers and increasing amounts that are being uh, the cash per month, uh, whether in amount or in numbers, it still has an end at the end, because government cannot fund, although I'm an advocate for social protection, but I see how the numbers are growing more and more, and at the end of the day, you have to have a vision, what is your transformative manner, in order to release a bit of the, to do some sort of social mobility and economic mobility, because cash transfer only would not shift the poor from poverty as, we, as much as we are looking forward. And that's why the Ministry of Finance and the economic reform in the country, cutting down on subsidies, uh, increasing taxations, uh, having some sort of economic reform, and it also aligned with lots of legal reform, whether for the social pension reform, for the uh, reform on the law for disability, law for economic, uh, law for SMEs. You're trying to align all of this within a, a rights-based social protection vision. So it took some time at the beginning, but now it, it is becoming more mature, but it, is, it has some sort of challenges as well, because the economic of the empowerment of the poor is not easy. And sometimes, because we are advocates for social protection, we see it as uh, as um, attracting to us, but for the business people, not only the economic empowerment of the poor is attracting. Sometimes we, feel we all know that sometimes they are unwanted because it takes time to build their capacities and the risks are even higher because their financial and non-financial services are not easily guaranteed and are, needs to be closely monitored. So we have to build a vision for the economic empowerment of the poor because thinking only of increasing the coverage and the amount is not the sole solution. The other thing is that the contributory social pension is becoming costly because it's becoming to be colored with investment side and not only with the social protection side. And so people are, are, are being released uh, or you know, there is a sort of withdrawal from contributory social protection and they want to link themselves to the non-contributory social protection. And that's why you have a problem of growing informal sector. So, and the last thing that is the capacity of the institutions, of our institutions, because sometimes the reform is too high and it's going faster, so much digitized, so much, you know, governed with uh, anti-corruption measures and well targeting, and but the uh, poor civil servants cannot cope with such fast reform and the complete digitization process, especially with the cutting off of nominations of civil servants. So it's becoming tighter. It has lots of challenges, but I mean, um, the, the issue is that the rights-based voices are up. And women, people with disabilities, they became to be more vocal for their rights. But the issue is to use this vocality in order to empower them and to make them as actors and not only as receptors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, very fascinating, and uh, I love your energy. And I think if you bring that to bear everywhere, then uh, you, you pull everybody uh, to your side. This is survival. <laughs> this is survival. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but, um, the MZ is emphasizing the need for better alignment uh, to increase the social protection coverage. Um, and we've heard some aspects already. Um, uh, international cooperation is important. We've heard that from many uh, sources right now. Um, how, how do you see, again, the vision for the cooperation for the strategies with your partners? Well, um, first of all, I want to say the topic is so big and so important. There is no single country who can solve the problems alone, and we cannot solve those issues with bilateral cooperation alone. So uh, there was, I think somebody was talking of being a little bit humble with the whole issue, and I think we also have to be humble what we can do with bilateral cooperation on that. And that is for me not uh, the moment to give up, but it's the moment to search partners for the topic and therefore multilateral European approach but multilateral approach is the way to go so we have of course to find a, a momentum to get international financing working that's the point you were 
pointing out before, um, we need the World Bank as a financial institution, the financial institution worldwide uh, on our side. We need um, partners like ILO with a lot of technical knowledge, a lot of uh, intellectual capacity on that topic on our side. We need the partner countries, we need the UN system. And that's where we want to be one positive part in the whole system uh, and work together if it's trilateral, if it's in supporting special uh, programs, if it's also, if I may say, in bringing sometimes partners together. I'm very happy that the World Bank and the ILO are uh, uh, having a good conversation now on those topics. That's very important to bring partners together and, and, and be helpful or supportive in, in that issue. But we also work, for example, with the World Bank in countries like Rwanda and Uzbekistan, especially there on, on, on those topics. So you have to come up with trilateral, multilateral thinking on implementing. Uh, we work with UNICEF, I think that was pointed out before also, on the issue of countries in fragile contexts. We have to think about those countries also need a, probably a little bit of different approach. So we work uh, with various, various uh, partners on the international level, um, well, yeah, to generate the maximum impact on the ground. And, and that's what we do bilaterally and what we could offer bilaterally. We do, of course, uh, do political discussions with our partner countries. Not only about ne the necessity, I get the experience that a lot of our partner countries have realized how important uh, basic social protection is. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is how to do it, how really to do it, how to finance it, how to do it uh, in a digital appropriate way, how really to reach those who I need, not the 10% working at the state somewhere, but the reaching the poor out in the informal sector, and how to do that, and how to support that. Um, that is something we can offer additionally uh, with technical assistance, and of course uh, on the short term with financial support, but I always point out it has to be a system which is uh, based in the financial possibilities of the country because it cannot be forever financed from abroad. Mm. There has to be something growing inside the countries um, and also developed inside the countries and that's something we would like also to support with digitalization, programs on digitalization, with programs on uh, I once again talk about revenues and financing because it is important, that is important and good financial governance is crucial for those things because you have to make clear why you're collecting the money from the taxpayer and what are you spending it for so that has to be transparency in the system. That is something we're working. But there are so many sectors aside, that's why I was talking about energy, why I was talking about education and so on. There are so many sectors aside and therefore also by bilateral cooperation can be or should be helpful. Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, Magdalena, I look at you and uh, um, I'd, I'd like to ask you about the role of civil society in the whole process. And maybe also the, the second question is, um, where do you, from your standpoint, see, see the main obstacles for the expansion of social protection in uh, different countries? And how can we overcome them, of course? There, there are many obstacles that are shared by several countries, and maybe I can uh, summarize in, in three. Um, one important one is the lack of obligations. And here what I'm referring is national law obligations. And here what are protection, privacy, um, equality laws. Those laws cannot be considered as an afterthought in the design of a social protection system. Our social protection systems are not gender equal, uh, are discriminatory in access for many, uh, for many people in the countries. And now that we're talking about digitalization, well, data protection and privacy, if these programs are going to those living in poverty, we cannot, I mean, they are not receiving the programs and giving their privacy back. We have to respect their privacy too. So this, this is a common thing. I hope that in line or at least in the rooms, there are more human rights lawyers like me because 
the teams have to be interdisciplinary. We need human rights people designing, implementing, and evaluating this program. A second obstacle that it was already mentioned by Stefan in his presentation is the deep rooted stigma against those living in poverty. And this is particularly clear when uh, in the design of conditional cash transfer programs. The, the, a wonderful book that I will recommend, Just Give Money to the Poor, give already the evidence and good advice. We don't need conditional cash transfer programs that in most cases are uh, limiting the the time of women and are increasing their care and domestic work. So this is a wonderful idea, let's put more conditionalities, but we are really in many cases impairing the, right, the equal rights of women to access the program. So, and, and this is about, it's an issue of political will. I mean, if we want to get the support of middle classes, we might need uh, conditionalities, but it's also the role of the states to ensure that public policies are based on evidence and change the behavior of the societies. So, and this is a very important issue from a human rights point of view. And the third obstacle to finalize, I, I will summarize it as the lack of coordination or harmonization uh, within different institutions that are working on social protection. So um, within a government, sometimes Minister of Women's Rights or Social Welfare are less prioritized than Minister of Finance, or even the commitments made by the Minister of Foreign Affairs regarding human rights are not considered in the design. Uh, we also see that in many um, organizations, UN organizations, for example, and the same with international financial institutions, there is a lack of coordination. So many, I mean, the ILO, UNICEF, um, and, and others have already committed to a rights-based approach to social protection. To what extent everybody designing and implementing and provided technical assistance in this organization are aware of those commitments and the the, the real implication of them. And also we know that sometimes there's been uh, divergences in opinion or approaches between international financial institutions and UN organization implementing uh, social protection. So these have to be addressed. Uh, we need the political will, we need the uh, increase in coverage of social protection systems everywhere, um, those also protection systems need to be funded, and I'm going to clarify this, this point, mainly by domestic resource mobilization. Many middle-income countries do have the capacity to increase their fiscal space to do that, and they, they should do that. And this is the main difference between the MDGs and the SDGs. The MDGs were based on international cooperation. The SDGs give very important, a lot of importance to uh, domestic resource mobilization, and that is key. But there are some low-income countries that would not be in a position to expand the coverage and change specific programs or projects, as we have been discussing, into system if they do not receive international financial uh, support and international technical support. And also for some middle-income countries, if they receive the, some international financial system that respect their ownership of the, uh, the policy, uh, then they will then be in a better position to mobilize their fiscal space and to convince their own citizens on the importance of social protection systems. Thank you so much. Let me sort of uh, expand from that, uh, Mamta. Uh, you mentioned the SDGs, and of course, everybody uh, sort of looks at the half time mm. uh, that we have, uh, seven years left uh, till 2030. So um, we have seven years to reach, amongst others, SDG 1.3. Um, 
where do you see the contribution? Where do you see that in the face of the mega trends? And you know, I don't have to repeat them, but uh, ecological and um, the arrival of war in in areas of the world um, that hadn't seen war, uh, war for a long time. So, how do you see that adaptive social systems as one of the tools can actually be contributing to the um, to reaching 1.3? Um, I think uh, adaptive social protection is going to be really helpful in getting to the um, uh, getting to several SDGs. Um, but if I may, I just want to uh, step step back a little bit and and uh, uh, bring everybody's attention, since uh, there's so many people in the room, uh, bring everybody's attention to the huge amount of knowledge work that is going on. Um, that can actually support countries in expanding adaptive social protection. It's knowledge work that we don't do ourselves as the World Bank, but we, uh, uh, we, we contribute to along with others. So um, there was a shout out to Ugo Gentilini. I, I also want to give a shout out to Colin Andrews, who's in the room, uh, because we do a lot of work on, on op, uh, you know, the opportunity gap that I talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a lot of work on that, and, and we've put together a compendium of all the programs all over the world, not just financed by the World Bank, but financed by government, financed by NGOs that work on this. So, so please, please look into that. Um, we also uh, produce every year something called the State of Social Protection. Uh, again, looking at what's happening the world over, and, and this, is a, this is a great resource for everyone. And, and we also have something called a, the Social Protection Delivery Handbook. So if the, you know, it's everything you wanted to know about social protection but were afraid to ask, uh, <laughs> please, uh, please go yeah. to it because it can help you with this delivery gap. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm sorry, I stole some time from that's the fine. previous no, question, okay. but okay. just to say there's a lot of knowledge work uh, that can help with these gaps. Please, please go, uh, go to World Bank slash social protection and you'll, you'll find all of this stuff. Now, um, I think there's, we already talked about climate. Uh, and the importance of adaptive social protection in helping with climate shocks. And I want, here I want to make uh, the point that I already made in, the, uh, in my opening remarks that we need to think of adaptive social protection as helping both with adaptation and with mitigation. There's a tendency to think that it's only on the adaptive side, but it's also on the mitigation side. And, and so I think in you know, all of us who believe in climate action, we need to make sure that adaptive social protection is an important tool in climate action and, and not, to, not to have these conversations separately. Um, I also want to talk about international labor mobility because it is in the headlines everywhere in the world. Uh, wherever you go, it's going to influence elections coming up. Uh, I, in the country that I live in, uh, the United States, it's a hot button issue. It's a hot button issue here in, in Europe. Um, we just launched the World Development Report uh, on migration, refugees, and societies. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we really think that uh, the conversation on migration needs to, needs to change. It needs to be reset. There is a lot that uh, receiving countries need to do, and there's a lot that sending countries need to do. And uh, receiving countries are not really rich countries only. You need to, I mean, a lot of the migration that happens is happening to middle-income countries. Uh, and middle-income and low-income countries are the biggest hosters of refugees in the world. So I, I, we, we wrote this report because we want to reset the dialogue on, on migration and economic mobility and the importance of adaptive social protection as a part of that uh, refugee integration and uh, labor mobility conversation. So, so I, 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 um, uh, you know, I don't want to put too many objectives on this one tool, but I, it is a many splendored thing. So think about, uh, we need to think about in the light of climate change, in the light of international labor mobility, uh, and, and uh, growth in the number of refugees, also with the war in Ukraine, we need to think about uh, this, making this tool more flexible to meet the needs of the moment. Uh, th that's, that's the idea that I want to leave you with. I, I, I cannot but uh, have also a sobering remark, which is that the world is way off track in meeting the SDGs. Um, 
I wish I was wrong, but I don't think they are going to be met, not with COVID and, and the multiple crises that have followed. So I think it's upon all of us to play the role that we can wherever we sit in, in supporting getting to the, uh, getting to the SDGs. Uh, and I, I feel that this group here, which has such an important function and works on these important issues, has its role to play. So I hope that we can all work together and, and make, uh, you know, just because we won't get to the SDGs, it doesn't mean we shouldn't go as far as we can. And I, I think that that's what we should all try to do. Thank you. Maybe that's why they're called goals. <laughs> And ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I now have uh, um, a very uh, big request uh, of my panelists because I'm, I'm going to dare uh, start a sentence and um, you're going to just finish the sentence. This has not been talked about before. So um, we're going to make it and we're going to make it short. Yes, my organizers say, you know, we have to finish in time. Uh, Maybe Mrs. Kuflov, maybe Babel, um, um, seeing that you're used to that kind of game. Um, <laughs> in three years' time, it's sorry, it's in three years' time, comma, dot, 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 social protection for all is? Is achieved. No. <laughs> but that's the goal. Okay, the okay. Wish. Okay. No, however. I know it's unrealistic. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I want to have that energy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody daring to uh, sort of in three years' time and maybe uh, uh, Niveen uh, related to Egypt? Boosts on investment, uh, investment of resources, of human capital, and in communities in order to achieve social protection. So it's investment. Thank you very much, Magdalena. In three years' time. I will also take the positive approach uh, and the goal. In three years' time, the coverage of social protection programs are going to expand considerably around the world. Thank you very much. Uh, Mamta, you were the voice of reason and the one saying, hmm, now it's all up to you. In three years' time, uh, BMZ and the World Bank are going to host another event exactly like this in Berlin. And all the connections and contacts that we have made in, on adaptive social protection would have resulted in progress uh, in working together and helping achieve universal social protection. Thank you, ladies, for this grand finale. And uh, thank you very much. Maybe you give the whole panel one more round of applause before we relieve them. Magdalena, Berbe, Mamta, Niveen, thank you so much. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, certainly to the audience that is watching us, let me remind you that there is another screened uh, part that we're going to start in the afternoon. So we hope that you will rejoin us at 1.30, and that is, of course, to the online community. Thanks very much for having watched us.